Welcome everyone to Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, we have Dr. Aniwa Ouso Bang uh, here with us this morning. Uh, and before we begin, I'll invite Dr. Emily Levin uh, to introduce uh, our, our speaker, Dr. Levin. Thank you, Dr. Campbell, and good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Today, we're joined by Dr. Aniwa Ouso Obang, who is an assistant professor in the Departments of Medicine and Genetics and Genomic Sciences. Dr. Obang joined Mount Sinai in July 2013 and has been spearheading clinical pharmacogenomics implementation efforts in Mount Sinai's outpatient clinics ever since. She also leads development of provider and patient educational materials and tools on pharmacogenomics. Moreover, Dr. Owusu Obang directs clinical pharmacogenomic rotations for pharmacy residents in the Mount Sinai Health System and advanced pharmacy practice experience rotations for student pharmacists. She has published over 35 peer-reviewed manuscripts and book chapters on pharmacogenomics and precision medicine. She's an active member of the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium and the Pharmacogenomics Working Group and the NIH-NHGRI-funded IGNITE Network. She is the current co-chair of the Early Career Committee in the Pharmacogenetics Research Network, where she also serves as a member of the Developing Countries Committee. Her research interests mainly lie in developing best practice processes to effectively bridge the gap between discovery of genetic determinants of therapeutic response and their adoption into routine clinical practice. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm just sharing my screen here quickly. Awesome. All right, so thank you once again for having me. Today, my talk was titled uh, Translational Initiatives in Pharmacogenetics or Pharmacogenomics um, in the Mount Sinai Health System. So to begin, I have nothing to disclose in terms of financial disclosure. My objectives for this presentation are outlined here. The first is to be able to describe potential benefits and key principles in pharmacogenomics. And also at the end of the lecture, I hope that you'll be able to recognize medications with clinically actionable pharmacogenetic implications. And lastly, and most importantly, to be able to utilize Mount Sinai-led um, pharmacogenetic initiatives to in incorporate this uh, discipline into your pres prescribing practices. So I want to start off with a case report. And I, the reason why I like to do this is, um, I'm sorry. So, I wanted to highlight the relevance of pharmacogenetics, especially when it's ignored. So in this case report, it happened in Canada. It was all over the news back in 2008. This was August 20, 2008. And the headline of the news article said, coding used while breastfeeding may be dangerous. And why is this? So in the case report, it was reported that uh, a mother who had recently given birth um, had a child that was uh, had difficulty breastfeeding, was feeling lethargic only seven days after being born. And um, up until about 13 days later, the mom called emergency services because the child was not responsive. And unfortunately, the baby died. And what happened is when they did a postmortem analysis, they realized that um, toxicology testing revealed the blood concentration of morphine at 70 nanograms per ml, which the normal that is suspected would be anywhere from zero to 2.2 nanograms per ml. And this being the mom had been prescribed Tylenol number three, or what we know as uh, codeine and acetaminophen for a C-section, post C-section pain. And the mom happened to be a CYP2D6 ultra rapid metabolizer. And as she was breastfeeding, she was also in, invertly given um, the baby high levels of morphine. The reason for this, I just want to quickly explain that codeine as a, um, as a drug is actually a prodrug for its analgesic properties. Codeine needs to be converted by CYP2D6 or cytochrome P450 2D6 um, to uh, morphine where, where it exerts its uh, analgesic properties. 
So as an ultra rapid metabolizer, the mother was making too much of the, or was converting too much of the codeine into morphine. Hence, the baby was also being dosed with morphine and unfortunately died only 13 days after delivery. So this case report, just keep this in mind as we talk about the rest of the presentation today. So let's start with an introduction to pharmacogenetics. I believe many of you here are familiar with this practice that we currently have, what I describe as the one-size-fits-all approach or the trial and error approach. This is when a patient comes into the health system and they're diagnosed with a certain conditions. We tend to prescribe medications to treat that condition without any regard to the patient's genetic information. That's the status quo currently, or the one-size-fits-all approach. But does one size truly fit all? If you look at this graph here, we are looking at a percentage of patient population for which a particular drug in the drug class is ineffective on average. Average. And so the averages are listed here. So when you're looking at antidepressants, about 38% of the time, the drug that is chosen for a patient is ineffective, all the way to about 75% when you consider even oncologic uh, agents. And so we are not doing so well with this strategy or this approach of one size fits all when it comes to efficacy. Well, now let's look at adverse drug reaction. So in the US alone, there are about 2 million patient, uh, patients experience serious adverse drug reactions in the, um, in, in the year. So when we say serious, these are things that lead to either uh, hospitalization or emergency room visit, right? And it's also been reported that it leads to about 100,000 deaths annually. And it's also the cause of about 20% of all injuries and deaths uh, to hospitalized patients. Not only does it cost us patients' lives, it's also very costly. About $130 billion are attributed to direct medical costs as a result of adverse drug reactions. And almost half of all ADRs occur in patients 65 years and older. So with this approach that we currently have, we're not doing so well with efficacy, but also with ADRs, we are also not doing so well. And this graph is only is showing hospitalizations due to ADRs. And this was reported amongst US adults uh, 65 years and older between 2007, 2009. And so if you look at the top five agents that are commonly implicated in adverse drug reactions, you, and you know anything about pharmacogenetics, you will realize that these ones listed here, warfarin, oral antiplatelet agents, hypoglycemic agents, and opioids are all very well uh, known PGX implicated medications. So possibly had we known about the genetics of these patients, could we have prevented these ADRs? Could we have prevented these hospitalizations as well? So when it comes to medication response, uh, the, the factors that influence that are many or multiple, they, these factors have been attributed to clinical factors such as maybe the patient's body size, a BMI, sex, age, you know, nutritional status, and so forth, all pathological such as the liver function or the kidney function. We are known to renally adjust many medications, and so we know that these influence medication response, even comorbidities. Also environmental factors, drug-drug interactions, diets, and so forth. But throughout this presentation, I just want you to remember that genetics or genomics also influence how an individual responds to medications. And this is usually due to, you know, the genetic variations and gene expression levels that are responsible for the either the drug targets or the drug uh, metabolizing enzymes. Those tend to be the common ones. So knowing this, we are moving or have shifted into this era of precision medicine. And this was what, um, or personalized medicine, this was really made possible 
after the completion of the Human Genome Project uh, that allowed us to have a lot of tools for research and also enabling clinical translation. According to the National Human Genome Research Institute, personalized medicine is defined as an emergent practice of medicine that uses an individual's genetic profile to guide decisions made in regard to prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. And they go on to say that knowledge of a patient genetic profile can help doctors select the proper medication or therapy and administer it using the proper dose or regimen. And so, um, like I mentioned earlier, this has been advanced through data from the Human Genome Project. You might hear personalized medicine also being referred to as precision medicine, individualized medicine, tailored therapeutics. There are so many different, I guess, uh, naming schemes out there for it, but the concept is truly similar that instead of this traditional one size fits all approach, where patients with the same diagnosis receive the same treatment, then now you are able to stratify patients into different groups based off their genetic profile and treat them accordingly. So with precision medicine or personalized medicine, we get a subset of that, which is called pharmacogenetics or pharmacogenomics. Um, the main difference here is pharmacogenetics is the study of the relationship between variations in a single gene and the variability as seen or demonstrated in drugs, disposition, response, and toxicity. Whereas pharmacogenomics is the study of relations between variations in a large collection of genes, even up to the entire uh, genome. Right, so the, that's the main difference. Pharmacogenetics as a term was very popular starting in about 1957 was when the term was initially coined. And up until the 2000s, that was the dominant word. But after the completion of the Human Genome Project and us having um, the entire human genome at our disposal, then you started to hear more of pharmacogenomics um, later uh, from the 2000s up until now. And the term tends to be used interchangeably, but these are the main differences. So when it comes to variations in um, medication response. There are two main areas of medication uh, disposition that we are concerned with. Usually it's pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamics of the drug. The pharmacokinetics of the drug, this is when you are concerned with how the body's, um, the body's influence on the medication, whereas pharmacodynamics is the drug's influence on the body. So um, with PGX, we are usually concerned with genes that encode the drug transporter proteins that influence pharmacokinetics and also the drug metabolizing enzymes there. And also when it comes to the pharmacodynamic side, we're mostly interested in the uh, genes that encode the drug target proteins. And together, these lead to variability in efficacy and toxicity of these medications. So knowing this, you know, but in pharmacogenetics, you tend to hear a lot about cytochrome P450 enzymes. And those listed here in the phase one enzymes, you see a lot of them with CYP3A5, 3A4, 3A7, CYP2D6, a very popular one, um, encodes about 25% of all um, prescription, uh, all medications, not just even prescriptions or metabolizes, as you say, about 25% of all medications, also CYP2C9, CYP2C19. These are very popular um, enzymes in pharmacogenetics. We know they are responsible for oxidation, reduction, and hydrolysis. Um, and also with the phase two enzymes, we um, use the genetics of these, especially UGTs and the NAT1 and the NAT2 enzymes here as well. So let's state a fact here that actionable pharmacogenetic variants are commonly expressed in the general population. Uh, among those of us on the line today, my bet would be that at least 90% of us have what we call actionable pharmacogenetic variants. Um, 
and, and it's very commonly uh, expressed. Let's look at some of the data here. So in Vanderbilt's uh, PREDICT cohort, which is also the pharmacogenetic cohort, it's about 10,000 patients. They genotype the patients for five genes and they realized that 91% of the entire cohort carried actionable pharmacogenetic variants. But this variant uh, rate was even higher to 96% in the African-American patients. Similarly, when uh, the uh, eMERGE study emerges a multi-site uh, NIH-funded NIH um, consortium, and between that, we found 96% of the patients that were sequenced carried actionable pharmacogenetics. And also in the right protocol, this is from Mayo Clinic, from their pharmacogenomics cohort, they found 99% of their subjects carried actionable variants. And this is after genotyping a dozen genes. And similarly with the Veterans Association, uh, the Veterans Health Administration um, study of a million vet veterans, they found 99% of veterans also carried actionable pharmacogenetic variants. So the, the prevalence of this is, is very high and these are commonly expressed. So just note that. A second fact that I want to put out there is that actionable pharmacogenetic implicated medications are also commonly prescribed. So not only are the variants common, but also the medications that are uh, implicated with these variants are also commonly prescribed. Why do we say this? Let's look at what we currently have. So in the US, um, the US FDA and even the EMA in Europe, so combined there have been about 1200 approved medications in all. And out of the 1200, 15%, which amounts to about 180 drugs, have what we call pharmacogenetic information in their drug labeling. So you might say, well, Aniwa, um, that's true, but not all of that is actionable. And you'd be correct. Not all 15% have actionable uh, information. Only 7%, currently, I think it's about 8 or 9% as we get more and more guidelines put out there. But I'll stick with this conservative percentage of 7 So 7% um, have actionable pharmacogenetics, meaning that the drug label is telling you to do something different based on the patient's genetic information if you were to have it, rather than just going off what the label recommends uh, normally for dosing. So this amounts to 84 medications. So 84 medications out of 1,200 meds that are approved um, have actionable pharmacogenetics. And once again, you might say, well, that's a very small percentage. Why should we be concerned with that? The reason why you should be concerned is that these 84 medications out of the 4 billion outpatient prescriptions written in the US every year, these 84 medications account for 18% of all these prescriptions. That's 720 million prescriptions are written for medications that have high risk pharmacogenetic implications. So pharmacogenetic variants are common and the medications that are implicated are also commonly prescribed. Now, also in addition to that, there are resources that are available to clinicians to help them guide um, or adapt pharmacogenetics into practice, such as the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium Guidelines. These are the standard um, global guidelines based here in the United States, and they can be accessed by the link that, are, that is listed here. Currently, they advise on 64 medications and uh, for 24 genes and counting. Also, the FDA has three main resources, the drug product labels themselves. Also, the FDA curates a table of pharmacogenetic biomarkers in drug labeling. This is easily accessed through Google. Also, the table of pharmacogenetic associations, which is a more recent and a more concise and precise um, resource from the FDA. And that's also easily accessed through Google. And lastly is the pharmacogenomics knowledge base. This is also a website that curates all literature and clinical annotations of pharmacogenetics. It's very um, detailed website there. So you have all these resources. So you might be asking, why are we not using this in practice today? 
And the main barrier to adoption here is that most of our clinician force and even patients lack knowledge about pharmacogenomics, are not aware that this is even possible. Most people don't, even if they are aware, they don't know where to start, how to use it, how to implement it. Also, there's some evidence, a uh, lack of evidence supporting clinical utility of some of these testing. There have been limited insurance coverage and reimbursement um, issues and lack of supportive infrastructure technology and even personnel that are trained enough to be able to guide our clinicians to use this into practice. So knowing all of this, I just want to introduce you to our main objectives here at Mount Sinai when it comes to pharmacogenetics. We have a threefold aim. The first being translational research and also then educational initiatives to empower patients, pay, uh, providers, and all key stakeholders that are needed for effective implementation. And lastly, the aim is to really translate this into practice, make this the standard of care here at this, um, in this health system. So let's start off with an example of one of our translational research programs. And our objectives are listed here to develop and successfully implement best practice processes for clinical pharmacogenomics, and also to expand the evidence base for drug gene pair associations and clinical utility. So we had a, a research program that was that began, uh, we got approval 2013, we began enrollment 2014, went live end of 2014. This was called the IPM PGX program, IPM standing for Institute for Personalized Medicine. It was um, funded by Mount Sinai. And the aim of this project was to implement pharmacogenomics in our outpatient clinics and also to, to uh, establish uh, best practice processes using clinical decision support embedded into our EHR system to see whether providers will use this information if the information was presented to them in a manner that was um, clear, concise, straight to the point. And so we sought out to do this pilot project with IPM PGX. Along the way, we got funded as part of eMERGE PGX, which is NIH and the GRI funded um, multi-site consortium. And we happen to be part of that project. And so these projects were very similar. The main differences was the type of genotyping or the type of genetic testing that was uh, employed. IPM was more genotyping genotyping versus sequencing and eMERGE. And with IPM PGX, the providers were consented and surveyed, but in eMERGE, it was a small group of providers, so they were co-investigators. And eMERGE, we limited our implementation to simvastatin, clopidogrel, and morphine, where, whereas IPM PGX had a limit less. But we used a platform called ClipMERGE, which I'll talk more about later. So together we enrolled about 1,600 patients from IMA and FPA, and the breakdown of the patient demographics are listed here, very diverse cohort, 42% Hispanic, 31% African, 22% European ancestry, and mostly females. We also were able to do these one hour training sessions for about 420 physicians, uh, including attendants, fellows, and residents. When we, we employ preemptive genotyping in both of these studies, but I'll be talking to them, uh, I'll be talking about them as a combined study. And um, the preemptive testing resulted in us noting that approximately 77% of the patients had at least one actionable variant, and we only tested for four genes. Noted that previously I showed you sites that are tested for more than four, some five, some a dozen, but we even saw 77% have an actionable variant. And when we looked at the breakdown, 77 had one actionable variant in one gene, 27 had actionable variants in two genes, 5% had actionable variant in three genes, and 1% had actionable variants in all four genes that were tested. 
And to, to deliver pharmacogenetic information to our prescribers, we use the ClipMerge platform. ClipMerge stands for Clinical Implementation of Personalized Medicine Through Electronic Health Records and Genomics. This was a platform that was developed here at Sinai and, and um, embedded or integrated into EPIC. It was external to EPIC, but there was an integration system there. So with ClipMerge, whenever a provider opened a patient's records, we got clinical information or um, the medication that they, they intended to prescribe. We got that data into the ClipMerge database. Also, because of preemptive testing, we had also received the patient's genetic information already from um, the lab. So what ClipMerge would do is do a risk assessment to see whether that patient should be getting that medication according to their genetic profile. And if they shouldn't, ClipMerge will send a message back into the EHR system in the form of an alert or a BPA. So we implemented these drugs that are listed here, clopidogrel, simvastatin, warfarin, codeine, tramadol, nortriptyline, SSRI, citalopram, citalopram, sertraline, paroxetine, phenytoin, phosphenytoin, and we had others also in the works to be implemented. But I want us to just focus in on simvastatin just to show uh, an example of what the project was about. So let's quickly talk about simvastatin pharmacogenetics. We know statins are first line treatment for prevention of cardiovascular events. However, there is response heterogeneity in the patients. About a third of patients do not achieve clinically desired reductions in LDLs, especially with simvastatin. And they also have um, side effects, adverse drug reactions associated with, with them. The most common ones being statin, statin induced my, myotoxicity. It can lead to treatment discontinuation or even poor adherence among patients. They tend to not even mention it until an event happens that they've stopped taking the, the statin because you know, they were experiencing muscle pain. When it comes to statins, the, the gene of interest here is what we call SLCO1B1. It's a gene that encodes a transporter protein that moves statins from the plasma into the liver cell. And so when patients have variations in SLCO1B1, it decreases the function of this transporter protein. So it keeps more of the statin in the plasma, which ends up causing the toxicity, the muscle toxicity. So it was recommended that patients that have the variations, they should get a different statin other than simvastatin, or they should take simvastatin at 20 milligrams or less. So some of the evidence to support this is this um, paper here that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine that looked at variations in SLCO1B1. So the C allele is the risk allele. So patients that are homozygote variant carriers, the CC genotype, they tend to have a 16.9-fold increased risk for statin-induced myotoxicity, whereas the heterozygote variant group, the CT, tend to have a 4.5 fold increased risk uh, for statin induced myopathy and compared to the normal, which is the TT here. So this led to the CPIC guideline um, in 2012 that recommended that patients that were TC or CC, so homozygote, homozygote variant and heterozygote variant carriers should not use simvastatin more than 20 milligrams or they should be switched to an alternative statin. So this was the recommendation that we followed. So in our patient population, we realized that the Sinai population, um, our cohorts uh, had 80% were normal, about 18% were intermediate function, and then 1.52% here were poor function or low function. They were the homozygote carriers of the, of the variant. So to do this, we devised a strategy that a logic that would uh, clip merge, which is the platform that we use for our clinical decision support will look for. First, it looks whenever we get a simvastatin prescription, it checks to see that patient's uh, genotype is available in the system. If no, we don't worry about it. But if yes, we check to see whether their genotype is homozygote variant, CC, or is it a TC, or which is the heterozygote variant, or the normal. 
So based off which genotype we fire a BPA. So the BPA looked like this, a best practice advisory. So the mock version, this is for the SSCC or the poor function group. So according to genetic testing, this patient has this genotype. The genotype confers high myopathy risk with simvastatin, particularly with doses greater than 20 milligram. Consider prescribing a lower dose or choose an alternative statin. So this was our recommendation to the prescriber uh, to the prescribers in uh, in the outpatient clinics. And this is how the BPA looks in EPIC. And so here you see that um, it says, click here for further information. The, doc the doctor can click there to get more information. And once they do that, it opens up another window that is just um, a summary of simvastatin and SLC1B1, the relationship with that. It also links directly to the guidelines for the prescriber just in case they want more information. Also, they can preview the smart set. This was our list of alternative medications that were recommended. So if you previewed, it opened up this window that listed all the other alternative statins that we were recommending at that time. And then the prescriber could also choose to accept the recommendation when they do that. This opens up a window in Epic that shows a copy of the alert that was just shown to them for their reference. Also a list of all the alternatives that are recommended here. And they can easily just click on any of these and continue the order entry process from here without having to cancel the whole thing and start over. So this was our intervention in that study, looking to see whether prescribers will use this information. So um, the number of patients that ended up getting simvastatin prescription are listed here. We missed some opportunities to fire the BPA, but ultimately we had about 102 BPAs for the intermediate group and 32 for the poor low function group. And when it came to adoption rates, we saw that prescribers were following the advice about 64% of the time, they adopted the guideline, uh, the guidance, the genetic guidance here, yeah, which most, um, most of them kept the patient on 20 milligrams. And also um, atorvastatin was the most changed alternative uh, statin, followed by pravastatin and rosuvastatin. About 30, uh, 36% of the time, they didn't change at all. Currently, the guidelines have been updated that for statins, it's not just for simple statin alone, but for all the statins. And this was just a February 2022 update to the guidelines. So just wanted to highlight that here that for the decreased function, which is the intermediate group, that these are the recommendations. And for the poor function group, um, these are also the recommendations. So based off the statin dose intensity, uh, you get to choose uh, which statins you want. And the light gray boxes are better options than the black box uh, black boxes here. So for our findings from that study, we, we can state that um, preemptive genotyping and use of clinical decision support tools have enabled our primary care clinicians to adopt pharmacogenetics into routine care. And also from our secondary analysis, which are not shown here, but prescribers may have considered more than just the genetic in, um, information to make their decision, which is very promising and something that we really like to see that we are not blindly just following the PGX, but you're also considering other things. We looked at the statin dose intensities, and that was a significant factor that um, seems to have influenced whether prescribers followed the recommendation or not. And also now we can, uh, we can state that adoption of pharmacogenomics into routine practice is feasible, especially with this strategy of preemptive testing and clinical decision support tools embedded in the EHR. So now I wanna also highlight some of our educational initiatives here. So the two main stakeholders that we are concerned with when it comes to education are our clinicians and our patients. So I would first highlight our educational tools for clinicians. 
to do this initially, before we even started the IPM PGX project that I just highlighted, we conducted a needs assessment. After we did the provider trainings, we asked them to complete pre and post training questionnaires. And uh, some of this information was embedded in the CDS as I showed earlier. So through our pre and post training questionnaires, we realized that, and this is already published, we realized that most of our clinicians, when it came to experience with clinical decision support tools, about 90% of them had used it before or were used to or aware of um, clinical decision support. However, when we asked them, if how often do you perform genome-guided prescribing, over 90% also said they had never used genome-guided prescribing. So this gave us the opportunity to think of combining um, PGX with a CDS that they're already familiar with. And that's why we did um, we uh, designed the study the way that we did with the ClipMerge platform. So we know that our providers are not so knowledgeable about PGX or they don't use it often. So to, do, uh, to help them, we've created a CME. This is actually live and any clinician on the line today who wants to learn more, you can register for the CME. It's available and uh, there's a tiny URL here, just tinyurl.com forward slash PhDX MSHHS. And you can access this uh, CME, you can register and be part of it. This offers four hours of training, introduction to pharmacogenetics, and also highlighting different clinical applications in cardiology, in psychiatry, and also in pain management. Also, we've created these counseling guides to help our clinicians, particularly pharmacists, but also any clinician who wants to counsel their patients on pharmacogenetics can use this. So the first guide that's listed here is a reference card that we can provide for our clinicians. And the first one here is for pretest counseling. And this is when you use the acronym PGX drugs to, to counsel. This is of... Um, Knowing the purpose of the test, the genetic concepts, X as an example, drugs, drawbacks to the testing, risk and concerns, you being understand the patient's view of the testing, G, what is your game plan and process, and final S here is sharing PGX result. So this is just an acronym to help understand or to guide you to uh, the counseling. Also, there is post-test counseling guide, and this is with the acronym CPIC. This is where you circle back or confirm and collect, which is the first C. And this P is here, uh, PGX guided pharmacotherapy review. I is inform providers and others, and C is conclude and plan. So these reference guides could also be made available to clinicians so that they can use this um, to, get, to guide their patients. But mostly this has been for, um, was developed for pharmacists to be able to counsel. Also, we've developed these protocols in-house. These are one-page summaries of the various drug gene interactions. An example is shown here for PPI, so proton pump inhibitors, and their association with CYP2C19. It will tell you, based off the phenotypes, which are here also, what are the recommendations for each of them. So this is also available. We've created this for um, over three dozen drug gene pairs and counting. So overall, our education, uh, educational opportunities for clinicians, we have live training with the CMEs, these grand rounds, faculty meetings, also maybe town hall meetings that we plan to do. Also active help would be through point of care, real-time clinical decision support, which is also going to be available very soon for throughout the health system. And also pharmacy service uh, on pharmacogenetics, as well. And then with these reference cards, the one page summaries, the guideline, uh, the counseling guides, and even email support pgx at mountsinai.org, you can get some information through these avenues as well. So next, let's talk about uh, patients um, and our education for them. So we
We've created these brochures. This is your guide to pharmacogenetic testing. It's a, a trifold brochure. And um, this is the inside package where, where it talks about what genes are, what is pharmacogenetics, advantages, benefits, and so forth. This is in patient-friendly language that we hope our patients will be able to use. This is also a post-test Count a slim brochure. This is for a patient who happens to be a poor metabolizer of CYP2C19 and has been prescribed clopidogrel. We hope that we can use these brochures to really get them to understand their results and empower patients so that they can become advocates for themselves wherever they go in their care. So when it comes to patient education, we have these pre-test, I should say, pre-test counseling and post-test counseling. And also we have patient brochures, videos that we've been creating in our web pages to help guide them. Overall, so clinicians, we have patients and of course trainees, we conduct uh, rotations for pharmacy residents, pharmacy students, medical students on um, research mentoring and also genetic counseling students. We have summer volunteer opportunities in this space as well. So there are many opportunities for training for pharmacogenetics within the health system. So lastly, I want to talk about our clinical implementation and the work that we hope to be achieving within partnership with everyone on the line today. So the vision for this Mount Sinai program is truly to establish Sinai as a leader in providing comprehensive or precision medication management through the deployment of pharmacogenomics. Um, it's a team effort and it takes more than just one person to do this. Um, so with this between the pharmacy department, the Charles Bronfman Institute for Personalized Medicine, uh, testing partners, also departments of medicine, genetics, and and even our clinical partners um, who are the front lines, uh, those that see the patients uh, on the front lines here. And that program design is truly a quality improvement program through pharmacy-led um, medication therapy management. And here, the key stakeholders, that testing is available to all eligible uh, patients and even employees of the health system. And also, we would like to do an implementation strategy that integrates into current pharmacy and clinician workflows using EPIC and also our pharmacist-led PGS clinical service. And um, it's going to be led by pharmacy uh, because of their unique training in pharmacology and also in, in genetics in this space as well. And lastly, we hope to employ a preemptive testing approach in the sense that if you order a test for a patient that you know, let's say you're, you're choosing between antidepressants and you order CYP2C19 testing, we wouldn't just test for CYP2C19, but we test the panel so that we would have that other information for future use whenever a patient needs something else. So the drugs and the medications are listed here. These are the ones that we are currently considering. As you can see, it spans multiple clinical specialties, analgesics, antibacterials, anticonvulsants, antipsychotics, you know, antineoplastics, the antidepressants, and so forth. So the list is enormous, but we will start maybe with a few different specialties. But if these medications, if a patient has an actionable variant and we need to advise on these medications, we'll be able to do so as well. So who are the eligible patients here? We are looking for patients who um, uh, have had a history of a pharmacogenetic related adverse drug re reaction or treatment failure, or have a, an express family history of these. Also patients who have been diagnosed with conditions that would warrant a pharmacogenetic medication. We are also very uh, interested in our polypharmacy group, patients that are currently on five or more active medications, patients of certain high risk ancestry, and this is very medication specific. And lastly, anyone that's willing to pay for the test is truly welcome to be part of, to, to get this tested. And we hope that our clinicians will help us to identify these patients. 
So to order this test, uh, it's called Mount Sinai Pharmacogenetic Genotype and Panel in EPIC. I think if you, if you type Mount Sinai, it's probably the first option that comes up instead of pharmacogenetic. So that would be the way to go about this. And there are a set of questions that you get to answer. Um, that's, we use saliva kits and they are mailed to the patient's home. So it would be best if you chose saliva kits so that the patient will receive this in the mail. They will collect the sample and return it in a self, um, in an already paid envelope that comes with that kit as well. So there are some questions here that the clinician will need to answer. So for our overall workflow, we hope that providers will identify a patient who can benefit from the test and that they will let the patient um, make a telephone or virtual visit appointment with a pharmacist for pre-test counseling. And here you, you, your reason for the visit would be a pharmacogenetic pre-test education. And the provider would then send the chart to the pharmacist uh, upon closing the encounter for awareness of this. The pharmacist will conduct the pre test counseling. And then when the results come back, the pharmacist will also conduct a post-test counseling with that patient. And of course, share the results with the provider as well. So in a pre-test counseling visit, these are some of the things that the pharmacist will make sure the patient is aware of. So we'll conduct a medication reconciliation review, confirm mailing address for the saliva kits. Some of the mailing addresses in EPIC may be out of date, so we just like to confirm that. We want to review saliva collection instructions. For instance, before you collect the saliva, you must not have eaten anything or drunk anything within the past 30 minutes. So it's best to collect it right in the morning as soon as you wake up, you know, so those are some things that we like to tell the uh, patients, review insurance details, set any potential cost or copay expectations, uh, also set expectations with a report, review the brochures with the patient, get a consent form and schedule that post-test visit as well. So after the pharmacist meets with the patient and provides all this information, the patient will receive the kit at home. They'll provide um, the saliva testing. Pre-COVID, we were considering blood as well, but I think the salivas have been working fine, so we would like to keep that. And then the, they send the test back to the lab. The test was resulted within 10 to 14 days, uh, business days after the sample has been received. Pharmacists will discuss the results with the prescriber who ordered the initial test and counsel the patient on the results. And the pharmacist will also provide a summary report to the patient. So when it comes to billing, we've talked to um, the health systems, UMR, and they've approved testing for eligible employees of the health system. Also prior authorizations may be required for some third party uh, payers. So these are all part of that initial pretest visit that we would like to sort out. And there's also a self-pay option for patients and laboratory, um, uh, the clinical lab also offers financial assistance for eligible patients based on income. So there are many avenues through which we can um, get the testing done for our patients without just um, letting this reimbursement be a bit major barrier. So lastly, I just wanted to share an example from um, uh, one of our patients in our pilot rollout recently, 31-year-old male referred to our testing due to a medication consult for major depressive disorder. This patient had tried previous medications but had multiple side effects, including worsening depression and significant mood swings uh, with um, the plans uh, prior to this. And then, so we conducted the test. The patient happened to be a CYP2C19, star two, star two, which confers a poor metabolizer status. And this is consistent with significant deficiency in the CYP2C19 enzyme activity. So it, as such, we, would, we should exercise caution with CYP2C19 drug substrates. And so medications that are likely to result in side effects with standard doses are amitriptyline, doxepin, uh, citalopram, escitalopram, sertraline. And the escitalopram recommendation here 
uh, which the patient was considering was consider a 50% reduction of the recommended starting dose to help prevent um, concentration dependent adverse events. So we did that, we recommended that to the prescriber who started and the patient on, on a low dose, five milligram. And upon the follow-up visit, the patient had indicated improved mood with no side effects. So possibly all the other meds that the patient was um, had tried previously because of his poor metabolizer status had led to these concentration-dependent side effects and um, that he was not too happy with. So um, our program seeks to also track some of these outcomes and impact metrics, uh, such as our implementation metrics, our adoption rates uh, between providers, employees, patients, and patient engagement, also patient outcomes, such as adverse events, treatment failures, medication changes, adherence measures, and so forth. Also, we would like to track healthcare utilization rates as a result, how many have led to hospitalizations, emergency room visits, office and virtual visits, and even telephone calls, um, not necessarily to decrease the utilization of these, but possibly some of these things might be increased, such as even virtual visits or telephone, but not hospitalizations or emergency room. And of course, we like to track spending um, here as well as it relates to medication related events. So in conclusion, pharmacogenetics is a tool that offers prescribing guidance to ensure safer prescribing and to optimize efficacy. Many medications spanning in different clinical specialties um, have pharmacogenetic implications. So regardless of where you practice, I'm sure that there is an example in your field that you can get to know and be an advocate for. Uh, clinicians can make significant impact on patient outcomes by identifying at risk patients and adopting the appropriate dose and or alternative therapy recommendations as it relates to the patient's genetic profile. And Mount Sinai currently, as a health system, we are well positioned to effectively establish this clinical practice uh, in hopes to optimize therapeutic management of our patients. So um, uh, this is an effort and has been an effort from multiple people. So I just would like to acknowledge everyone that is listed on the slide for their uh, collaboration with us. And with this, I would like to thank you and take any questions. Thanks so much, Dr. Obeng. That was a great overview, very detailed summary of some very nice work. So uh, there are some questions uh, in, in the chat. Uh, I don't know if you can uh, see them, but I'll just uh, read out uh, a few um, for your benefit. And, and one was regarding pharmacogenetic testing in the elderly, frail elderly patients, mm -hmm. uh, and whether uh, there's any evidence of uh, clinical benefits, right, uh, of uh, increased testing in that population to decrease adverse drug events and help with deprescribing. Yeah, I mean, so if you look at some of the, so for instance, with cardiology, the best example here is with clopidogrel. And even in our own implementation, we've seen some benefits there that when you know ahead of time that this patient carries an adverse, um, a high risk variant, for instance, the 2C19 poor metabolizer, you do not want to use clopidogrel because it is a pro drug, needs to be converted by C2C19. However, if the patient is a poor metabolize that they have no CYP2C19 function, so they cannot activate clopidogrel. And we tend to see patients coming back into the health system with stent thrombosis or a secondary MI because they're on a drug that is not working for them. So there are some um, benefits that have been shown clinically with many examples. So I agree with you, especially in the elderly, they tend to be polypharmacy patients as well. So they are perfect candidates for these testing. Thanks so much. And a very important uh, comment from Dr. Aberg, uh, encouraging mm -hmm. uh, clinicians not to override the drug interactions when they pop up in Epic and uh, pointing out uh, some of the interactions with uh, Paxlovid, right, uh, for COVID-19 uh, treatment. So yeah. uh, important message to uh, contact. Uh, pharmacist ID transplant. I don't know if you have any comments on that statement, Dr. Frank. Yeah, I, I completely agree with Dr. Abert there. Um, that's why we actually designed our CDS to be a neon yellow. Uh, 
and uh, make it different. So initially we, we had it as orange and we switched it to, we just wanted to make our CDSs different from the standard Epic CDS so that when a clinician sees it, they say, oh, I've never seen this one before. Maybe I should pay attention to it. So we designed them differently just so that they would not be clicked through as most people tend to do. But yes, please read those alerts and um, contact the right person for help if you don't understand them. Uh, actually, to, to that point, uh, the simvastatin study that you showed, about 36% uh, of, of the time clinicians were not acting on the, the alert. Do we know what some of the major drivers were for, for that? So I believe that um, some of the providers, the patients had been on simvastatin for a long time and had not experienced the side effect, so they were not willing to switch. I think that was one of the main concerns there. Um, but yeah, uh, we did, we asked them to tell us why they were ignoring. And of course, many of them did not respond to that. <laughs> so this is also yeah. a question. <laughs> yeah, thanks. All right. So th there's a question about uh, whether you'd recommend uh, pharmacogenomic uh, or genetic testing um, upon initiation of antidepressants, right? If the patient's willing, can afford it, um, uh, or doing a, first, uh, a trial first without uh, testing regarding antidepressants. What, what are your thoughts? Definitely. We, we want to. That's, I, I believe that pharmacogenetics has its most application and impact at initiation of therapy, not when the patient is already stabilized on a dose or on a medication. And the hope here is that at initiation of antidepressants, that you would avoid that trial and error. So because we know that most patients go through two or three medications, especially antidepressants, before they find what works for them, if they find what works for them. So with pharmacogenetics, we will be able to eliminate some options way ahead of time and let you just concentrate on the ones that genetically should work for the patient. So if they don't work, we know something else might be going on and not just the genetics. All right. Uh, one question related to the price for self-pay. Uh, do we know how much it would be out of pocket? Yes, it's about a hundred. It's 149 is what the recommended is the negotiated price, I should say. Okay. And uh, there was one question about uh, any information on, on uh, drugs, pharmacogenetics and kidney uh, patients specifically, right, uh, regarding kidney patients in the nephrology space. That, that's a very good question. I mean, uh, not, not necessarily pharmacogenetics of kidney patients, but um, pharmacogenetics would be an added uh, risk or information that you should have on top of renally adjusting that patient. So you might not even go through that pathway at all. You might select something else because if the patient has a risk with the genetics and also may have some kidney issues, then you have sort of a two uh, double edged sword there, right? So knowing the pharmacogenetics will help you to, um, I would say uh, maybe avoid that patient, treat them even with more caution than not knowing. So I think that it's it should go hand in hand. Pharmacogenetics doesn't replace any of the tools that we have in our toolboxes now. It's just an additional tool that as pharmacists and as clinicians, we should be using to optimize these drug regimens for our patients. All right. Uh, thanks so much. And then there was a question regarding where patients would get this testing outside of Mount Sinai Hospital, um, whether they could go to their PCP to have uh, the pharmacogenetic testing ordered. So that's also a good, good question. Most institutions don't have this option. I believe in the New York City area, Mount Sinai is the only institution. So we tend to even get patient requests via email, patients that just see our website and just say, you know, I'm not part of Mount Sinai, how can I get tested? So I don't know where else outside of Mount Sinai um, within this area that you can go. I'm sure maybe if you talk to your PCP, they would be able to look up some of these testing labs and order from them. But within Sinai, we of course have this option and, um, um, and we also accept new patients for the testing as well. All right, uh, and just uh, two more questions. I mean, one was, um, where do you send the saliva samples for testing? Is it Coriol? We currently send them to Semaphore. Okay. 
Okay. And uh, and then, uh, yes, um, one question regarding the any specialty specific test that's not on the list. Uh, how, how do you expand the panel, right? Uh, just the, the process. I mean, there are HLA uh, for susceptibility loci, anti TNF agents. Um, I guess uh, th that's sort of a practical question. How does this list get expanded, right? Uh, you know, what, you know, powers required from a population uh, genetics perspective? Could you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, so I mean that the panel was basically designed for what we considered actionable at the time. But as time goes on, we keep um, also updating the panel's content and coverage as needed. And also um, there are some technological complexities with some of the tests. So that's why it cannot be added on as a panel. We can do them individually, but not as a panel test. So if this is a request that um, we are seeing more for, we can possibly um, consider adding that on as well. And for funding wise, uh, yes, there is financial assistance through the lab for patients based on income. Gotcha. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Bing. I think in interest of time, we'll, we'll pause, but want to really thank you again uh, for an amazing presentation. Very useful, very clinically applicable. Thanks again. Thank you all for having me. Have a great day.